Um, I hope you guys are having a healthy and safe quarantine. Um, I've been doing a lot of schoolwork, as you might imagine, and I am finally ready to present my thesis, Becoming Jane Rochester, Charlotte Bronte's Victorian Post-Structuralism. So this thesis began probably about a year ago when I just couldn't understand why people didn't like Jane Eyre. I couldn't understand why people didn't like her relationship with Rochester, why anyone would criticize the book as anti-feminist. And so going through my own processes, I originally started with the works of Mary Wollstonecraft, who Charlotte Bronte certainly would have been familiar with as an educated woman in mid 19th century England. So Wollstonecraft's Vindication on the Rights of Women, which was published in 1792, founded the tenets of liberal feminism, and her ideas likely influenced Bronte's own feminist politics. So in turn, eminent feminist writers like Adrienne Rich on one hand and Victor Virginia Woolf on the other have warred over whether Jane Eyre truly constitutes a feminist text according to Wollstonecraft's original tenets. However, I believe that liberal feminism as practiced by Wollstonecraft does not adequately capture the entirety of how Bronte's heroine conceives individual autonomy and selfhood. The problem with feminist theory and subsequently feminist criticisms of Jane Eyre is that these theorists judge Jane by how well she performs her gender according to prescribed norms. A vindication on the rights of women calls to educate women in the same way as men have been in order for women to truly enact virtuous behaviors and morals rather than simply parroting virtuous behavior that they observe in others. However, Wollstonecraft is so preoccupied with diagnosing the problem of women's present subjugation that she structures her arguments exclusively towards institutional change and does not offer a path to self-determination and independence within the present society. Even if women achieve the highest standards of the virtuous education available to men, they'd simply reform the way that they represent themselves in society and not question either the validity of the social norms or their own personal relationship to them. So un though, although Bronte undoubtedly supports Wollstonecraft's political aims, she would reject women's essentialization to a politically disenfranchised category in need of liberation. Rather, Charlotte Bronte acknowledges the often conflicting identities, behaviors, and social roles to reveal the complexity of Jane Eyre's human existence. Jane Eyre's central character progression explores the relationship of self-subject and society that mirrors, mirrors post-structuralism as practiced by Michel Foucault and Judith Butler in the latter half of the 20th century, especially regarding Butler's theory of gender performativity. Post-structuralism insists that how one represents oneself in society may not align with one's true understanding of the self. Judith Butler builds off Foucault's foundational theories of the care of the self to confront how the very existence of the gender binary obstructs an individual's ability to construct an autonomous self-identity. However, Butler believes that we are undone by each other, that intimate human relationships are wholly necessary to cultivating the self and discovering both individual and relational autonomy. Charlotte Bronte had unintentionally fictionalized this very philosophy over a century before in Jane Eyre. The novel follows Jane as she struggles to cultivate and accurately represent this eye by connecting her subject, Jane Eyre, Jane Elliot, and eventually Jane Rochester, to this narrator eye, confronting gender and class norms that interfere with her innate desires, emotions, and use of reason. The first person narrator, the eye, communicates Jane to the reader while contextualizing how that Jane speaks and acts in a given situation or relationship. Representing herself as the subject, Jane, the narrator, I, successfully forms the critical relationship to social and gender norms that allow Jane to revel in her own total autonomy and, in turn, enjoy a truly egalitarian, intimate relationship with Rochester without submitting to the oppressive standards of traditional heterosexual unions. Across several distinct developmental stages within the novel, Jane negotiates her own senses of gender, selfhood, and autonomy through post-structuralist methods, commencing at Lowood with Helen Burns and concluding in the epilogue with its infamous opening line, Reader, I Married Him. In the climactic scenes of each stage, Jane arrives at a point where the I narrator declares its intention to speak, creating a confession that, in the words of Foucault, constitutes a permanent verbalization that converts the attachment that the human being has to himself to an attachment to something beyond the human, to God. The most prominent scenes of passionate confession in Jane's self-cultivation include Jane and Rochester's passionate engagement discussion, their argument after Jane discovers Rochester's living mad wife, Bertha Mason, locked in his attic, 
and then the novel's climax when Jane refuses St. John's marriage proposal to return to Rochester, whose ghostly voice beckons to her over the moors after almost a year apart. In each scene, Jane communicates the desires of her eye through three distinct methods, public dialogue, a private inner dialogue, and ultimately plain narration, where the self and subject become congruous unit and the eye speaks to Jane's own self. Jane's spoken confession at each decision point brings her closer to the ultimate product of a cultivated post-structural self, where the eye has become completely independent and able to comprehend and disregard the power of social and gendered norms. Accordingly, Jane is able to approach an intimate relationship with Rochester without the trappings of traditional gender norms, thereby casting aside the power dynamics and patriarchal patterns replicated in traditional heterosexual marriage, which Wollstonecraft and most feminist scholars who followed point to as the most private and pervasive of patriarchal institutions. However, Jane's own assurance to the reader that she married him constitutes a mere formality for placating Bronte's audience in conservative Victorian Britain. Rochester and Jane embody a cultivated post-structural selfhood that allows them to burst the conventional limits upon the relationship and enjoy a true union of body and spirit, equal under God's feet. Jane Eyre does not succumb to social norms when she marries Rochester, nor would her story improve by having her leave Rochester and exist as an independent working woman, as some feminist scholars would seem to desire. Jane Eyre allows herself to become Jane Rochester because she has learned through a post-structural process of self-cultivation that considering the totality of her lived human experience, she truly desires at her deepest part of herself to love, live with, and in Butler's words, to become undone by Rochester.